My name is Enid Slack, and I'm the director of the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance at the Monk School of Global Affairs here at the University of Toronto. On behalf of Alan Broadbent, who is the chair of our board, the other board members, and the staff at IMFG, I'm pleased to welcome you here today to the session on London's Crossrail, a case study in transit investment with our guest speaker, Jim Barry. Before I introduce Jim, I would like to say thank you to the sponsors of our institute, Havana Capital, the province of Ontario, TD Bank Group, and the City of Toronto. I would also like to thank our staff, Andre Cote, who's uh, the IMFG Director of Programs and Research, who organized today's session, among all the other things he does for the institute, uh, and Stella Kyriakakis, who's at the back. She's our administrator, and she was in charge of all of the logistics today. And thank you, Stella, the mic is working. The event today is about London's Crossrail, which some have described as a transformative transit investment that will cross London from east to west. It will cost an estimated 16 billion pounds. I did a quick calculation on my iPhone app. It's about $27 billion, and is expected to open, at least in part, by 2016. The Crossrail involves a complex public-private partnership between the national and local governments, the business community, and stakeholder, other stakeholders. The financing for the Crossrail comes from funds from the national government, uh, fares, private sector contributions, development levies, and a business rate supplement on business property taxes. As you may know, in the UK, local governments can levy residential property taxes, known as the council tax, but the business property tax is set uniformly by the national government uh, and is redistributed to uh, local governments. But they are permitted, the local governments are permitted to add a supplement onto the national uh, uh, business uh, taxes, uh, known as the non-domestic rates, uh, to pay for projects that uh, have an economic development component. And London has chosen to do that for the Crossrail. As we struggle with how to make transit investments in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area, and looking at where the funding will come from, uh, we here at the Institute think it's important uh, to look at examples of what has been successful in other places to see what we can learn from their experience. The Crossrail is a good example to learn from. So our question today is very simple. How did they do it in London? I'm now delighted to introduce the person who's going to answer that question for us, Jim Barry. Jim is Senior Vice President at Hatch Mott McDonald. Throughout his career, he has played numerous roles, including architect, planner, project manager, negotiator, and diplomat on large urban transit projects around the world. And I think he's going to talk a little bit about that diplomacy today. Jim worked for Canary Wharf Group on two occasions to promote new rail capacity in London. The Jubilee Line extension between 1988 and 1991, and he worked on the Crossrail between 2001 and 2010. Acting on behalf of Canary Wharf Group, Jim was instrumental in the planning, promotion, design, and implementation of the Crossrail project. So who better to answer the question, how did London do it? Please welcome Jim Barry. Okay, thank you Enid, and, th and thank you for inviting me to talk about a project which, uh, which I've enjoyed very much being part of, but also about London, which is one of my favorite cities in the world, if not my favorite, and, um, and, and of course Canary Wharf. I was very fortunate to, invite, to be invited to work at Canary Wharf in 1988 by a colleague that I worked in Vancouver with, and that's where I first met Paul Reichman, and I'm pleased to say one of, one of my colleagues from that experience is actually here today, which, is, which we haven't seen for quite a while. Um, I just want, as many of you know, Paul Reichman died last week, and, and I just want to simply recognize that. This was the vision of Canary Wharf in 1987, uh, when many of us uh, went there, from, many, from London and other parts of the world, to help build this, this, this incredible place that it's become today. It has a, it's had a history which I'm sure many of you know about, but it is, it is by, by any standard, a very successful development as it is, as it is today. And basically, that's... Oh, sorry? I'll go back a bit. That's what it looks like today. Uh, we are now approaching the 20 million square feet mark. When Paul originally got involved, he envisioned a, a 12 million square foot development 
in, in 25 years, and uh, we've now surpassed that, and uh, are now looking forward to going towards, uh, two, we have 100,000 employees going towards 200,000 employees, so it will be a, a very significant development on the, on the east end. Is there any way I could get a little more light down here so that I can see the computer? Thanks. That's great, thank you. Okay, so a little video just to give you an idea of what Crossrail's about before we get into the, into the nitty gritty. I think that Crossrail is one of the most exciting transport projects to happen in London in the last 50 years. Crossrail will be a real catalyst to, uh, to, to regenerate some areas of the West End which really are perhaps lagging behind and which need a real improvement. Piling rigs, barges are already in the North Dock, getting ready to build the Canary Wharf Station, the first project on Crossrail. Crossrail will shrink London in a way which no other rail project has ever shrunk London. Journey times will be dramatically reduced, particularly from this part of the world to the West End. I work in, in uh, Canary Wharf and uh, if it means I can get to my clients quicker then that's great. Anything that gets you from one point to the other seamlessly has got to be good. bring jobs to construction and I'll work in construction so that's good news. Stations like Tottenham Court Road will provide fantastic facilities for, for visitors to visit but they'll also supply brand new retail spaces. program and we're on budget and the next few years are going to be very exciting for London and for everybody involved in the project culminating in the opening of the railway in 2017. It really is an incredibly important project and I think a project that uh, all Londoners can be incredibly proud of in 2017. Okay, uh, there are 58 slides and 58 stories, so I'll, but I'll try to compress it a little bit. Um, and uh, so, so I have to start from the fact that I did work for Canary Wharf. Uh, we recognize the importance of this project and we also recognize the needs of transportation to Canary Wharf. So to that extent, my driver and ultimately my involvement uh, is from that perspective. And so hence you see here a picture of, of Canary Wharf on the left side, the Crossrail station in the water to the right, 
and the red route represents the route going back into London. Obviously, it goes be beyond this point at the same time. Um, but, but the starting point was, and, and uh, my good friend Michael, who was over there earlier this year, is that Canary Wharf is built on transport. And if you remember that, that quote in the front, uh, transport is to Canary Wharf as water is to California. The Isle of Dogs is surrounded by water, and you certainly weren't going to build any new roads through that part of London, as you can see the level of density that exists there. So they're really the only way to get to this place was on rail transport. And, and its growth and, and its ability to operate is, is predicated on rail transport. But in fact, that applies to London. The mode share of, of, the mode share of public transport users at Canary Wharf is about 80%. The mode share of, of central London is more or less in that order. So you don't get in and out of London unless you go on some form of rail transport. So in terms of what is, what is cross rail, so it's a new railway, east, south, east, east, west. It does go into the southeast quadrant and the northeast quadrant. It's about 118 kilometers, so it does go on an existing rail network, the Great Western on the west side of London, west of Paddington, west of Heathrow, and the Great Eastern, which is east of, east of Liverpool Street. About 24 trains an hour, uh, 200 million passengers a year, and of course lots of nine uh, underground stations. The 15.9 billion that you saw referenced in the, uh, in the video has actually now dropped to 14.8. Uh, billion. Okay, so to understand the Canary Wharf perspective and how Canary Wharf played a role in this thing, you kind of have to look back to the beginning, and that was the Isle of Dogs in the Canary Wharf area. These are the, these are the West India docks as they looked more or less in 1987, and at the time that uh, the Reichmans became involved in that plate. The, the white line represents they actually purchased in 1987. They've subsequently purchased the land immediately to the left of, of that outline, which was uh, Heron's Key. That's what it looks like today. Uh, and uh, we're actually building the last building on the property that is owned by the original development. And all of the land that you see in this area here, that is also part of Canary Wharf as well. So essentially, this is a future development site, which will be a mixture of offices and residential. This is what's called Billingsgate Market, which, is, which has the potential to also be developed. Canary Wharf owns the land here. So there is, there is room for the development of about 35 million square feet of office buildings and residential in this area, uh, allowing it to grow to something like 200,000 people. Okay, but the story was that in 1987 or 1980, it was really literally abandoned docks, enclosed by walls, uh, and, and gradually the, the buildings became into disuse. And so there's a series of computer-generated images which I'm going to show you, which quite frankly, uh, what, what's interesting is Transport for London grabbed a hold of these images and started to use them to promote the idea and the interaction and the, and the relationship between rail infrastructure and future development. And, and as you'll see, Canary Wharf is, is predicated on that. So this is, this is 1987. A lot of the bu buildings that were disused were taken down and removed. There had been some development to the south, which is these small buildings and then some further development, but it was all one and two story scale development, and it was sitting on the back of what was called the Docklands Light Railway, which would open in 1987. It had numerous technical problems and capacity issues. It was nowhere near capable of supporting a development at the scale of Canary Wharf. By 1991, and this is just prior to when the, when, when the Reichman Empire went, went into a administration, that was the scale of the development. It was built on the back of the DLR, uh, there were plans to upgrade it in both in terms of capacity and in terms of technology. At the same time, um, Canary Wharf Group had done, an, a, done a, an, a, an arrangement with London Underground, with Transport for London, to actually create the Jubilee Line. However, uh, a number of circumstances, the economy, a number of financial issues, uh, lack of roads, changing business attitudes in, in, the, in the city, it all basically conspired to force the development into administration uh, in 1992, and then it didn't come out for a couple, until a couple of years later. But that was, but essentially that was, the idea was that you could build uh, a development on the back of a railway, it was connected to bank, but it didn't work. However, by 1999, and the Jubilee Line was opening, getting ready to open at the end of 99, just going into the next millennium, uh, the Limehouse Link, which was down here, was opened. Uh, this development, the residential development had been built, and clearly there was improved capacity, uh, improved rail capacity but as a result of the Jubilee Line, although the, the Jubilee Line was not working properly when we opened it. Okay, that was 2004, 2004-05. Uh, so we had the HSBC Tower, we had the Citibank Tower, 
We started building a number of buildings on what was called Herring Keys in those days, Clifford Chance, number of the biggest law firms in the world, and other buildings built. So we were up at about 12 million square feet at that point in time. That would have not been possible without the upgraded DLR and the Jubilee Line at that point in time. So, and, but at the same time, there was clearly room for further development in this area, in this area, this land, which was also owned by Canary Wharf, and the land behind. And in general, there was room for much more development but on the Isle of Dogs. And so, as we got towards the, this particular point in time, it became clear if the development was going to grow beyond, beyond this, this present scale, it needed more rail capacity. We initiated initially a, an increase in the capacity of the Jubilee Line by adding a seventh car, by putting a new signaling system which, for which Canary Wharf partially paid for. Um, and then the same thing, the DLR was upgraded to a three-car system. Both of those systems are now virtually maxed out and, and are more or less running at capacity. Uh, so for Canary Wharf to grow to the scale that it had planning permission for, uh, it really needed an, another railway. And that's how it could be with Crossrail, um, post-2018. Essentially, planning permission exists to allow all those buildings to be built. Um, but they can't be built without more transport capacity. And so, so the, story, the story is when I came on the scene in 2001 as well, so how do we get involved in this Crossrail project? And how do we help make the, pro make the project happen? But, uh, but, it, but it's from this perspective. And, and the reality is that there were other parts of London which could, which could grow. The, uh, there are a number of new high-rise towers now being built in the, in the city. There's new development in the West End. There's the potential for development in the Heathrow area. So in general, there is, there is, a, there is a growth tendency happening in London. Uh, but nevertheless, this is where the biggest growth will happen and, and the greatest potential for growth to happen is, at this, is, in, is in the East End. Okay, so just a little bit of history then. This is what's called the, uh, the land that was originally crowed by the, the London Dockland Development Corporation, the LDDC. Uh, this was the 1987 version of it. It's now been disbanded, but essentially this is the area that can be basically redeveloped and, and has been redeveloped to a large extent and is an ongoing redevelopment and will, and will grow even further by the time Crossrail goes. And so essentially this can support another 100,000 jobs over and above the jobs that are already in existence at Canary Wharf. Okay, so the need for crossrail is basically driven by population and employment growth and therefore trips on the underground. And so here you see where the population, so that's, that's the overlay of crossrail on a map of London. And so this is basically where you're seeing population growth and you can see a lot of it is occurring around, around parts of crossrail. So the underground, so the underground section is the piece in the middle in this piece here, here's Canary Wharf there, and, the, uh, and of course the, the main line are operating out uh, on the ends. And then of course the other side is, is jobs. And you can see how the growth of, the, the growth of jobs is, is more or less aligned around the, around the Crossrail route. Now keep in mind that the Crossrail route in central London actually parallels the central line. And, and, of course, one of the drivers behind the, 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 uh, the Crossrail story is, in fact, the incredible congestion that exists on the central line in central London. And this is, this is basically showing the level of congestion that exists on the tube. Here you can, see, you can see the black, and you can see the black all heading towards Canary Wharf. It's already, or it's already operating at a, at a level which, and if, if any of you have been on the, the, the tube in London, you know how crowded it can get. And so everything going into the East End, or for that matter, the Central Line going in towards Liverpool Street, is already in the black, and just simply there is no more capacity on those, on those railway lines. And of course, many of the lines are also operating in the red. So clearly there is a need for more transport capacity in London. And on the main line rail system, again, you can see the number of uh, things that are operating both in the red and the black. The, the two black ones on, the, on, these, on the middle in, in this section, this actually supports what a, another project which is happening in London, which is Thameslink, which is a six billion pound uh, project, which is also a, in, in progress at this point in time. Uh, it all comes together in, at a station called Farringdon where Crossrail and Thameslink will meet at the same time. A little bit of history about this project because it does have an incredibly long history. It was actually initially conceived way back in 1880 to run parallel with the Regent's Canal, which, wrap, which basically wraps around from the west side of London near Paddington over towards Canary Wharf and, uh, and then go underneath it. In the Abercrombie plan, it came up again as an idea of connecting east to west. 
And essentially, there's a, there's a railway that Brunel built called the Great Western, which comes out of Paddington and runs out to Bristol. And there's another one that comes out of Liverpool Street and runs out to east towards Shenfield. And naturally, railway guys, they like to connect these things. So they always wanted to connect the Great Eastern and the Great Western somehow through central London. Uh, and particularly as the central line became more and more crowded, that became more and more pressure. And so there was various attempts in the 70s and the early 80s to try to, try to get Crossrail to go forward. Um, interestingly, so in 1989, uh, which was when I was there working uh, to promote uh, Canary Wharf and the Jubilee Line, uh, we were promote, we basically the private sector was competing against the public sector for uh, this project to go ahead. It was the Jubilee Line versus Crossrail. The Jubilee Line won because we, got, we offered to contribute 400 million pounds. Uh, nevertheless, the, the Crossrail business case was weak at that point in time, so they tried on a number of occasions through different acts to try to get the project um, through into Parliament, but were not successful. Uh, not successful back until, until we got to, to much later on. So there are, there are various for, a project of this scale has to go through the UK Parliament and be subject to various committee reviews in the House of Commons and the House of Lords before it can get approval. Of course, it has to do environmental assessments and engineering and all those kinds of things. In, in the year, in 2001, is the SRA came on the scene and they started to actually get involved in the project and promote it in a, in a slightly different way and that was when I came on the scene with Canary Wharf and it, there was this kind of mixed role that I had working with, with, uh, with the SRA and the DFT because I knew something about transport, not a lot, just a little, but, uh, but I also worked for the developer uh, at the same time and we were trying to argue the case back and forth and it, it had actually worked. I was able to work for both bodies. So in 2003 and 2004, a man named Adrian Montague was retained by the, uh, the UK government to do a total business case review of the project and, and determine whether or not it should actually be funded, supported, in terms of putting a bill into Parliament. Uh, he's an amazing guy, and he's one of those kind of guys that, uh, that Tony Blair and Gordon Brown just relies on a guy like that because he's such, such a wealth of, of financial and economic knowledge. And, uh, and so basically he gave, he gave the project a, a thumbs up, and, and then the, the bill was actually then deposited in, into, into, the, into Parliament in 2005. Ever since we started working on the project in 2001-2002, the Treasury was adamant that this project was not affordable. And, uh, and I'm, we, we hear that expression over and over again, good idea, can't afford it. And, and so over and over and over again, it's kind of like, how do you, how do you come to terms with it's not affordable? Um, in terms of going forward. And so our challenge, uh, our challenge at Canary Wharf, as you'll see in a, in a little while, was how do you make this thing, how do you begin to pay for it? And the problem was always how to pay for it uh, and go for it. But let me just speak a bit about, about taking a, a project through the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Uh, after you do all your homework uh, in terms of articulating a project and doing your environmental assessments, uh, you are required to submit a bill to, to Parliament. That bill has to be supported by the members of the House of Commons. Um, and then it's subject to committees that are set up, including members from both parties, who review it. At that point in time, any member of the public, any, any organization in the public is able to go and scrutinize the project, criticize the project, and the project could in fact die in the House of Commons, as Crossrail did the first time around. Uh, we got through the House of Commons, but then you have to go through the House of Lords. Um, and so we literally spent, uh, spent three years going through these two houses to get the project through the House of Commons and through the House of Lords, gained subject to, subject to committees, and you would be amazed at the number of transport experts that, and lawyers that come out of the woodwork to support various groups to try to kill these projects. Uh, but we did survive, and, uh, and, and that has a lot to do with, you saw a man out there by the name of Keith Berryman. Uh, he and I were partners in many, many ways on this project, and, uh, and certainly he was the man who actually helped, from the engineering perspective, get this project through the House of, Com House of Commons and House of Lords. So, in 2007, uh, a funding deal was agreed. And so there's a, there's a story behind this. Gordon Brown was uh, seeking to become, uh, after he took over from Tony Blair, seeking to become elected as the Prime Minister. At the same time, Ken Livingston, who was the mayor, was also looking down the road at a potential re-election at the same point in time. And so, uh, if you know anything about the history of, uh, history of Ken Livingston and the history of London uh, and the Labour Party and so on, uh, it was important that those two guys somehow worked out a deal. And so, uh, about August, September of that year, 
Uh, the question was, well, what's it going to take to, what's it going to, take to, to uh, get the support of London for the support of uh, Gordon Brown? And the issue was Crossrail. And so uh, very, very, in a very rapid, <laughs> rapid fire, it was how do you pull this whole funding story together? Now, a lot, of work, a lot of homework had been done on how the funding should happen and who should pay and who should contribute, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but essentially, it all had to come together in a deal uh, such that by October 2007, there was a deal done and Gordon Brown was prepared to go for an election. Interestingly, for a variety of reasons, he actually didn't go. However, the funding agreement was done and the deal was done to allow the project to proceed and to allow the bill to actually then move into the House of Lords. Okay, so in 2008, we actually got uh, royal assent of the bill. And believe it or not, the bill actually has to come out of the House of Lords, go into a car, taken to the palace, signed off, and brought back. And, uh, and, and in fact, I was invited to be part of that process. So on the very last day, uh, in the House of Lords, uh, all, of those, all of those of us who really had worked to make this thing happen, sat there, saw it get royal assent approval, and then saw the bill come back, and then off to the pub. And, uh, and certainly, and, that, and it, was a beautiful, it was a beautiful day uh, and, and all that stuff. However, however, this happened not too long after it. And, um, and so there was more articles in the press about kill Crossrail, we can't afford it, uh, it shouldn't happen, etc., etc. And of course we were also going through another election where we were transitioning from the Labour Party into the Conservative Party uh, that, that's, that's in, uh, in power today in the UK. However, Crossrail did survive, did survive that, and it did survive the transfer from, uh, from the Labour Party to the Conservative Party that's in today. And, and I think that's one of the strengths of this project. The business case, the engineering, the thought, the degree of the level of homework, it was such that, that even, even the incoming party and their, and their incoming transport executives and treasury people, et cetera, et cetera, accepted that this was a good project for London in, on a variety of levels and were able to continue, su continue to support the project. And of course, you saw it, you saw it open, go into, uh, open in 2009. So in May 2009, it actually did start construction. And um, for one of my colleagues who are here, he'll recognize this place. This is the Canary Wharf boardroom. We have, a we have an entire model of London with all the railway lines on it. And so there's the guys, basically, there's uh, Boris Johnson and Gordon Brown. And, and they're happy guys because this, this thing is actually now going to get under construction. Okay, so we'll, now we'll get into the kind of the nitty-gritty part of the story on how, how we actually got it, uh, got it funded. So the core route, and this is where most of the money gets spent, from Heathrow out to just beyond, Canary, just beyond Stratford, which is, up, which is now where the Olympic development was built and the Olympic Games and Westfield development is up there. It's huge. Comes down to Canary Wharf and then it goes into the southeast quadrant down here in an area called Greenwich. That's, that's where most of the money is being spent on Crossrail. The underground stations run something in the order of 300 to 500 million pounds, and there's nine of them, so you can see how that rockets up into the billions quite quickly. And then, of course, the tunnels are huge. They're six, uh, they're six meters in diameter to support the kind of trains that you've... If you've been to London, you've been on the Heathrow Express, that's the kind of train that will run in those tunnels. Um, but essentially, that's the, that's the core. One of the good things that Crossrail does is connect to numerous places on the underground. And, and so what you're seeing here is, the, is, the, is the basically the tube map and the rail map. But it, as it goes along parallel with the central line, it's just south of Oxford Street, it connects into the Jubilee Line, it connects into the Northern Line, it connects into the Central Line um, at, uh, at Liverpool Street, it connects again at Canary Wharf into various things, and again up at Stratford it connects. So one of the great things it does is it connects into all those other, other tube lines that are central to London, but then it wanders out onto the main, main, main railway network. And of course, that's, that's one of the benefits of it, is it, it allows all that interaction and interchange between itself and other lines. The Jubilee Line does the same thing. The Jubilee Line is the only line which actually connects to every other tube line that exists in London. And so, and that's what makes London work, is that ability to change lines quite, quite easily between, between, uh, between different ones. Okay, so at the core, of the whole story, in terms of when you start looking at ec economic benefits and transport benefits and all this kind of stuff, you have, and somebody used the word four pillars and only, you're only seeing three of them here. You have Canary Wharf, which has the ability to grow from, 100, from the, its present 100,000 po population to 200,000. The city, which, 
which is in the 300,000 range, can, which can grow to in the 450,000 range. The West End, which actually, have, actually has a population, working population of about 750,000 employees on its way to a million. And then, of course, you have that whole development over in the, in the area of Heathrow, uh, which is huge in terms of its potential. And, and it, it hasn't really got started yet, but, but it will. And so in terms of, in terms of uh, economic drive and economic benefit, a lot of it has to do with those four places. And of course, uh, the, value, the value of the people who work and the, the income that those people generate is a significant tax generator for, the, for London and the, and the UK, and of course, plays into the business case for the project. Okay, so getting into that sort of nitty gritty stuff that transport planners do, and, and I should say, I'm not one of those guys. I'm, I'm at, my role here is a multi-dimensional role. Um, and so I worked with a lot of the companies that do this kind of work. But you get, this is the kind of stuff that, 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 you, that comes on the transport benefit side. Is that all the issues of accessibility and service quality and safety and those kind of things. New trains, mobility improvements, enhanced accessibility features, uh, reduced pressures on the road network, obviously. Reduced need for car use, re reduction in trips, reduction in carbon dioxide, reduction in road accidents, and all those add up to, and of course, time savings at the same time. And the economic side, which is, which is the big driver behind this particular project, is the reduced journey times and the value that that has. Over 35% of the future employment will, in fact, be on the Crossrail Corridor. Regeneration of East London, which is probably the most deprived area in all of the UK. The boroughs of Tower Hamlets, Lambeth, Southwark, Greenwich uh, have some of the highest levels of unemployment and the highest levels of deprivation in, in the UK. Crossrail will bring about a million and a half people within a 45, within a 45 minute trip commute to, the, to their work. And what was interesting, and we, we discovered that quite early in doing the analysis for, for Crossrail, that what employers are looking for is for, to be able to get their employees to work quickly, reliably, and as, and, and as fast as possible. So, and a 45 minute commute was, was a good number. And so, and so, if you look at the way the tube network works and the rail network works, that's possible. What they're looking to do is expand that catchment. And so what Crossrail did by, ex by extending out from central London, basically it allowed us to capture another million and a half people who could get to work in, in, uh, in, one, in 45 minutes. Uh, when you're looking at places like you're looking at an increase in popu working population of almost a million people, that makes a big difference if you're an employer like HSBC, who have 8,000 people in that building, or, or Citigroup, or, or Barclays, who have another six or 7,000 people in their building. So, so that, bec that became quite an important factor. Of course, increased productivity associated with clustering, and then 14,000 people in construction. Um, you probably heard, I'm sure that those of you who are in economics and planning, the, the clustering effect is, has enormous value in terms of agglomeration on the one hand, in terms of productivity on the other hand. So, so Canary Wharf is the classic example of clustering of banks and lawyers and financial services. The city, again, is the same kind of place that does all of that. Those places in that particular world are incredibly efficient and incredibly productive. And of course, the, the, la the, the wages that are paid in, that, in, in, in those worlds are quite substantial, so therefore their time is incredibly valuable at the same time. And that's, that's one of the differentiators between, say, London and the rest of the country, is, is the value of time associated with people who work in those professions versus people who may work in other professions. So this is just a map of showing the, the red areas where, where you see people who are able to get to work that much faster. And again, uh, southeast, northeast, and to the west. Okay, and this is just a reduction in journey times, uh, and some examples, and a lot, a, lot of them, a lot of them are cut by half, and in particular where they really get reduced is for the people who live in the east end, and particularly the southeast end. And, and that was a very important part of, of, of the story, was being able to, um, for the southeast, is because they have to go through an, a convoluted way to get to, get, to, get to London Bridge, is to be able to cut those journey times, and, and that has, that's incredibly valuable in terms of promoting this project. And then, of course, you get the wider economic benefits. And, and I think to a large extent, although Crossrail does, does stand up very well on its transport benefits, it's the wider economic benefits that, that actually, I think, make the day for that project. Now, what was interesting is when we were doing the Jubilee Line, uh, the DFT or the Treasury would not necessarily accept those wider economic benefits in the way in which we promoted them back in 1989. 
However, the DFT and Treasury do accept those now, and, and they play a significant role in, in, in establishing the value of that particular, of that particular project in London and, and certainly selling it to, to the UK Treasury. And so obviously the, the, the places I just showed you, Canary Wharf, the city, the West End, the move to more productive jobs, pure agglomeration, increase in labor force participation, and impacts on, on competition, all of those things play a major role in establishing the benefit case on, on the economic side. Okay, just some numbers, and again, these are, these are actually, you can, you can access this information on the, the Crossrail website for the business case, the, uh, the cost-benefit stories. Uh, it's very positive. It's presented in two formats, the DFT using the value of time, which is, a, which is not London-weighted, and the Transport for London version, which is, which is London-weighted in terms of value of time. So you see a, a, um, cross a BCR in the order of 2.76 or 1.97. Either way, it's a positive biz business case for, for the project, and that business case has actually become improved as a result of the capital cost dropping from 15.9 to 14.8. And then here you see, this is it when, when we take in the case of the sunk costs, and this is with the wider economic benefits, and you can see that it drops up, it jumps up even, up, even more once you bring into those, bring into the, the BCR of the, those kind of, those numbers. Now, the reality is, when you're dealing with the, tr the financial departments of TFL, the DFT, and the UK Treasury, uh, a project of this scale gets scrutinized to an unbelievable extent. And, and it's fair to say that prior to doing that, that, that decision in 2007, the project underwent an, an enormous amount of scrutiny uh, to allow it to proceed. But that's not the whole story, and we'll kind of move into that in a minute. Okay. So here we come to the story about it wasn't affordable, and that was the 2007 story. And so, so the issue was, was how, do you, how do you get people to pay for this project when, by and large, they don't want to pay for it, uh, on the one hand, and, uh, and how do you get people interested in, in that story? Uh, when I arrived, uh, we retained a company called CBR, CBRE to do an analysis of where we thought the property sector might be able to play a role in the funding of Crossrail. And, and so, so they published a paper, which was, you'll see uh, in a minute, uh, about looking at how we might start. The starting point was, though, who's going to benefit from Crossrail and, and how might they contribute to the cost of Crossrail? And so if you come down looking at the, at the various beneficiaries, and, and it's, it's a fairly standard list, is you obviously get the direct users of it in terms of their time savings and reliability getting to work. The users of other lines that either feed into Crossrail or benefit of benefit from Crossrail by virtue of transfer of passengers or creating more capacity on those lines. Uh, users of other less congested lines, obviously the road users, employers, developers, landowners, operators of other lines. From their standpoint, it's, it's, it's shorter commute for their employees, larger area of recruitment, support of urban development opportunities, uh, employers who have enlarged catchment area, and of course, increase in land value. All those things, and we hear a lot about that here in, in Toronto. Uh, and then, of course, the government, and the government from the perspective of economic growth, economic uh, activity, uh, increase in GDPs, social inclusion, and tax revenues. Uh, I want to go back to the employers. In the UK, um, property rates uh, and business rates are actually paid by the people who occupy the building. So, in the case of all those big buildings that you see at Canary Wharf, uh, their, uh, their overall tax bill, property bill, if you like, on an annual basis, for a million square foot building, you're looking at something in the order of 25 million pounds. That, that amount is either paid by the banks, paid by HSBC, or whatever the case may be. But it's the employer, it's, the, it's, the, it's, it's those people in that building, and the employer of all those employees who actually gets the benefit of, of, a, of a thing like Crossrail. So all those employers in Crossrail, it's fair to say, they, they all benefit as a result of Crossrail being there and as, as do all the other employers. So it is not just about property owners, it is about employers. And so all those big banks that generate, uh, that, that have need for thousands of employees to be in a particular place are contributing to the demand for public transport and are, of course, course contributing to, cross, to congestion on other lines, if that's, if that's the case. So, so in 2002, we published a document which we paid for and created, and it was called How Can Property Help? And uh, again, this was, C this was CBRE. And so we looked at a whole variety of, a variety of possibilities of how the property sector might play a role in helping to fund Crossrail. 
And so there were a number of mechanisms, and um, Ian has referred to some of them. One is, one is a thing called a business rate supplement. So for all intents, that's, a, that's, your, that's your property tax or commercial tax on property. The other are, are levies, which are paid through with Section 106, and all developers who develop new buildings in, in, uh, in, in the UK pay what's called a Section 106 levy, and that's essentially to support, pay for improvements as a result, improvements to infrastructure as a result of the development. And so that's, that's fairly common. And then, of course, there was, there was the potential for joint development, uh, i.e., where, where, uh, where the developer may, may play a role in building the station, pay for part of the cost of it, um, and, and build commercial developments as part of it at the same time. Those were the three ideas that came out of that particular story. The key, however, and this is where the diplomacy comes into the act, is if you're going to get the private sector to, get to, to pay, then they've got to understand and appreciate the value and, and understand how, how those costs, how the costs are derived, but how the benefits are derived and how it's a benefit to them. So the issue of transparency is absolutely crucial. Um, and of course, it has to be easily implemented. So idea, if you try to use something that already exists as a mechanism, that's not a bad idea. It's predicated on rigorous studies and linking funding to revenue, and then of course linking the funding to the project. So it has to be earmarked. So if, if we're going to contribute, it has to be earmarked to the project. And, and that, was, that was quite clear. Those, so those are the, some of the key things that came out of that story in 2002. So that story was growing. And as it grew, we actually became involved with TFL. So jointly, it's almost jointly, but quietly, TFL and, and, uh, and Canary Wharf Group figured out what the, what the property base was and what the potential was to raise money and how much for money could be raised off all those properties that you saw along that corridor to help fund this project from, from the property perspective uh, or the private sector perspective, if you like. So, one of the key things that came out of that thing was that we looked at all the property that had a rateable value above 50,000 pounds. It's now been changed to 55,000 pounds. And sure enough, you see a lot of them sit along the crossrail route. And so, so in a sense, all of the people who are in that corridor are probably, go, are, well, in fact, they are, they are subject to making a financial contribution to Crossrail, which I'll describe in, in a minute. So, so that was quite crucial. However, the, the principle does apply to all property in London that has that, has that rateable value above 50. So you see there's a few properties in the south that fall into that category as well. And of course, they benefit as a result of other lines being decongested or easier access for other people. And of course, along the corridor, one of the other things that came out of it was that those represent all the stations, and that's, your, that's basically the one kilometer radius around every station. And so all property that sits within those circles is likely to have to pay towards Crossrail at some point in some way, either through, through the Section 106 story, through another funding arrangement, which I'll talk about in a minute, or through a business rate supplement. So, and again, um, that's the typical circle that's looked at in terms of catchment for many transport projects, i.e. the distance that you walk in 10 minutes or 12 minutes. It's also the area where substantial development could actually occur on most of those, most of those stations. Okay, and so, and I'll come back to this in a minute. These are the rates. There is, so this was the third uh, mechanism that was, that was intru introduced. Um, it's called a community infrastructure levy. And those are the rates that people will, that developers will pay uh, both on new property and renovated property in those, in those circles. So basically 50 pounds and 35 and 20 pounds. It, it varies depending where you are. Uh, as you can see, Canary Wharf and all, all, the, all the big stuff gets, gets, gets into the big numbers. So as we, as we kind of bring all this thing together then, in terms of the project uh, is now at about 14.8 billion. And the way it's being, being, uh, being funded, uh, and I'll come back to the private sector again in a minute, is essentially uh, there's a contribution coming from the DFT, which is more or less a grant. That's the Department for Transport. And, and that's a combination of, uh, and it's coming in a combination of a couple of ways, through a direct contribution of 4.7. And then there's actually money coming from British, from British Airports Authority, also from the City of London. Uh, those are outright cash contributions. Uh, there's other funding that's associated with network rail, and that comes in at 2.45 billion, and, and, there's, and there's some other uh, private sector uh, funds coming in. On the TFL side, 
So TFL are, 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 are dealing with two parts, so 7.15 billion, and part of, it, part of their contribution is paid for through the business rates and these other funding mechanisms, and then of course, and then, and then part of it is a direct loan, or, or they will raise money through debt, and that's to deal with the fares component, the future fares component of the project. Okay, so getting into the nitty gritty of it all. So, so basically on the CIL, it's the community infrastructure, they will raise approximately 300 million pounds. Uh, and they're well on their way to doing that now. The business rate supplement will raise about 4.1 billion pounds. Uh, it's been raising on the average of 22, 22 million pounds a month so far. Uh, and so it will stay in place until it's actually been accrued to deal with the, the portion of the capital cost, but also it has to finance the debt associated with the capital cost at the same time. So it's going, it's going to run for a very long time. The Section 106 uh, contribution, and again, it's, it's doing quite well, um, and it will also bring in another, uh, another 300 million. Now there's a thing called OSD, which is Oversight Development, and I'll speak to that in a minute, is essentially the property cost to build Crossrail, the budget was about a billion pounds. So if you can imagine uh, demolishing buildings in central London in, in, on just south of Oxford Street, over near Liverpool Street, Farringdon, these are 10-story buildings, 15-story buildings, which had to be demolished in order to be able to build the stations at these locations. So property was, not an, it was a significant component of the project. The, um, the result is they are doing deals now with developers, with former property owners, to put buildings back on those locations, and so there will be a substantial, a substantial return back to TFL at about 445 million, and that's, that again is, fut is future. And of course, subsequent to that, there will be the fares that come in in the future. Uh, this is just an example of some of the oversight developments that are being planned. This is actually the junction of uh, Tottenham Court Road with Oxford Street. Um, so this is a building called Center Point. That's Oxford Street running to the left there. This, so you can't go up through Tottenham Court Road anymore. That site is up for renewal. Uh, you can imagine the controversy of tearing down a building which happens to be, even Paul McCartney got involved in, in trying to protect this building, uh, tearing that building down in order to build a, a station entrance. And that's the kind of building that actually will go at that location there. So again, that and, 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 and uh, Transport for London, Crossrail are, are all very much engaged in promoting those kind of developments to occur with the station. Now, w this particular location is actually the, where, cross, where Crossrail the central line and the northern line, and they all come together. Uh, the investment just in this corner alone is in excess of two billion pounds. And these are just some other examples. Now this is interesting, this is Bond Street, which is over on the edge of Mayfair. It's one of the most expensive parts of real estate in the world. Uh, we had to tear down the existing building, which is not unlike the building to the right, uh, in order to build the station. But, the, but uh, again, we were able to do the deals with the owners uh, as, and the developers in order to put a building that worked with the station and that will, and that will happen at the same time. And here's the one you just saw. Okay, so uh, I just want to touch on a couple of things in terms of ingredients for success. What, 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 what was it that allowed that project to be successful? So, from, from, you've seen from the Canary Wharf perspective that Canary Wharf couldn't grow uh, without, without, without more rail capacity. London couldn't grow without more rail capacity, and Crossrail adds about 10% additional capacity to, to the entire network. Um, London's growth would have, been, would have been constrained without more rail capacity. So there was a very, a very clear need for more rail capacity in London. There, were other way, there, there may have been other ways to do it, but, but Crossrail certainly worked as a project that worked in, in many, many ways uh, on, on the transportation side. The other, the other part was the business and community support. Uh, Canary Wharf jumped onto it, as did, the, as did the Corporation of London, as did British Air, Airways, as did London First, very early on in the project's uh, evolution, and supported the project and promoted the project worked with the government, worked with the various government departments, held numerous, numerous meetings uh, with various occupiers, et cetera, et cetera, to help the project go forward. All those, all those employers at Canary Wharf signed letters, as did employers in the city of London, signed letters to go to Tony Blair and Gordon Brown in support of this project and in support of paying that 2% that 
a 2p on the pound business rate. That was crucial. If they were not prepared to do that, that project would have not happened. If the private sector hadn't come forward and supported it, that project would have not happened. Uh, it, it would have died like so many projects that are created by planning departments. If you don't have the business sector on side, they don't happen. It was very interesting at about 2003-04, when I was meeting with the Department of Transport, they said, we can't believe how far you've got this project along in, in terms of pushing it up to the, uh, the in, in priorities within the UK Treasury and DFT without having a political champion, because neither Blair or uh, Livingston at that point in time would really come out public and say, yes, we need this project. They did gradually, as the, as the private sector pushed it and pushed it, come out and supported the project. So that was, that, that was absolutely crucial. Doing videos, videos like the one you saw, talking to all the people, the thousands of people who live along the corridor, the gain. So there was an enormous amount of work of getting people to support a project at that scale. And of course, this is a business case. Uh, the UK prides itself on the depth to, to which they articulate and penetrate, you know, the, the, the number crunching that makes these projects work and makes sense. Uh, we did it ourselves as Canary Wharf. We hired our own consultants. Uh, we examined the business case. We, we did our own versions of the business case. And of course, as did the Treasury, the DFT, and TFL. And so, so that there was no question that it was an absolutely good project, which also made it political proof. And to that sense, you, didn't, you, you, you weren't going to have somebody come along and say, well, here, let's put another map here. Let's do something over here, do something here. It was a very solid project. And so when we changed from the labor, labor government to the conservative project government, it survived because it has such a good, solid business case. Of course, there's the champion story. We didn't have any champions until about 2006, 5, 6, when, uh, when it was very clear that uh, Ken Livingston was going to be the champion. And, and without him, um, it wouldn't have happened. But then, of course, then uh, Boris Johnson was elected, and of course, he climbed on board as well. And, uh, and I think you've all seen, seen Boris uh, in, in various ways. <laughs> he's, quite, he's quite a guy. He's, uh, he's, a, he's a remarkable man. Uh, and I've been on the boat with him many times. We have, our own, we have, we have a boat down there, which, that's, anyway, that's another story. Okay, so, uh, so and the funding story, which I've just talked about again, if it isn't funded and, and, the, and the funding is not clear, it's not gonna happen either. And so the bill w could have not gone through parliament without having a clear definition of how the project was gonna get paid for. So that was why we had to do the, the deal in 2007. And part of that deal involved Canary Wharf actually making a significant contribution, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, directly to the cost. So, so in amongst all those numbers is about a billion pounds of hard cash, which is actually coming from private, sec from private entities. So in addition to all those other pieces of, that, that come through, through SILs and Section 106s and so on, there, there is actually some real money that, uh, that actually had to be put on the table. Of course, there's political support, and of course, finally, there's transparency. Uh, there, as, as you, when you go on the Crossrail website, you can get tons and tons of information about this project. Uh, and that was always available. There was always lots of information available. The consequence being that when, when I would go to with London first and we would go to, to, to meet uh, Gordon Brown or, or the other people at the, in, the, in, in the house, was there were very clear numbers which you could all talk about. It was very easy, very easy to grab a hold of, of what were the real facts. So you didn't have to debate, it, debate any of that stuff. It was very solid and it was very transparent and it was always that way. And there was a great deal of sharing between the private sector and the public sector in terms of numbers. And so a, a lot of the homework that we would do with Canary Wharf, we would give it to London first, we would give it to the Department of Transport, and, and that helped build the case. So that, that whole, the, the, you hear, heard me spoke about deprivation and social inclusion, we did all the work to establish the value of that. The agglomeration part, uh, it took a while for Treasury to grab a hold of agglomeration, but it was clear that's what Canary Wharf was all about, and that's what the city was all about, and it had huge benefits in, in terms of how you looked at the value of the project to the country, as well as to the tax base of, of, um, of the Treasury. We talked a bit about the champions, um, and again, uh, the, the, the private sector, they, they came out big time. All these big banks uh, would, always, would always come out and be very supportive. So, the, so you, you, needed, you needed the property guys, you needed the big banks, you needed all those guys, and they had to come out. If they didn't come out and, and, and be very clear that they were going to support the project, it wasn't going to happen. And so the business lobby, which was headed up by London First, um, British Airports Authority, Corporation London, Canary Wharf, 
in some ways, those groups are very, not counting London first, the Corporation of London and Canary Wharf can be very adversarial. Uh, and, and those of you who know about development know that the corporation tried to stop Canary Wharf from ever happening uh, on occasion. Uh, there was no shortage of, 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 of tricky things that used to go on between those two places, but eventually they did get together and, uh, and did support. And we, and we all, because there was a time when actually Canary, the corporation tried to stop Crossrail from going into the southeast quadrant. Uh, but nevertheless, we did get past that. And, and, but getting those people on board was absolutely crucial. Finally, on the decision makers, is you needed, you needed flexibility and you needed to be open for creative ideas. So some of the funding deals that were done were kind of part of that story, and I'll just touch on two of them. One of the stations was uh, in Greenwich, um, in Woolwich, uh, which again is a, a very poor part of London. And it was on a piece of property owned by Barclay Homes, large uh, residential developer in, in, in the UK. Um, the, in order to reduce costs, the station was taken out of the project. And so, but, and so Greenwich was not very happy about that. And so the issue was, well, how, did you get, how would you get that, get that thing back in the project? They did a cost-benefit analysis on the station. It was positive, but, but the question was, who was going to pay for it? And so the Treasury had decided they're not going to pay for it. And so the issue then was, well, how do, how do we get this developer, typical developer who didn't want to pay, uh, and Greenwich to come together to, make, to do a deal again with the, with the government to allow the project to happen? Um, because I had done the deal between Canary Wharf Station and the government for Canary Wharf Station, I was asked to go and see if I could help these guys. It's, a very, it's very interesting, and this is to get back to the image of diplomacy. So you get, a, you get a, a, an unwilling developer and a very willing uh, local authority to come together, and it's kind of like, so how do you do a deal whereby this, this developer feels that he's getting something, but he's also adding somebody to the project? We did that. And in fact, the developer finally agreed that he would pay for a portion of the station and build it. So he's, ta he's taking all that risk on that project. And so hence that station is now being built. And of course, he will build lots of buildings on top of it. But, but it's very interesting how, you, you, so again, it's that one of those kind of innovations where you actually get property developers or building developers building subway stations where that probably wouldn't happen in Toronto. Um, and, but nevertheless, it, it, it did happen and is happening uh, on, on Crossrail in, uh, in London. And a similar thing happened with Canary Wharf, and I'll touch on that later. Okay, and then of course I've touched on, on the business case and the absolute importance of a, of a good solid business case, and you can see the benefit-cost ratios that are, that are here. And again, these are, these are on the website and they're totally open for scrutiny. And you can penetrate those numbers if you want to. And of course then there's the, the, there's the wider benefits. And I think it's the wider benefits that actually makes this project really work um, and, and in, terms of, in terms of all of London and all of, all of the UK. And, um, and we spent a lot of time doing that. Now, there's a bit of a, there's a, bit of a story that goes behind that, is if you think about politicians supporting projects, getting re-elected, working with their, t with their colleagues in terms of wor working within, within the political spectrum, those, those economic benefits those transport benefits and those social benefits mean a lot. And you, you, you had to articulate what those benefits would be. And we spent a lot of time doing that so that when, when the bill was raised in Parliament and those, those MPs had to speak about the benefits of the project, they could speak openly and honestly that what the project was going to do. And so a lot of that work, it resonated with the politicians because because you, you, you did the number crunching and you could see what would happen to the deprivation index. You could see how people could access schools, access jobs, access hospitals. You could see those benefits and you could articulate that in a way which made sense for politicians who are speaking in the House of Commons or the House of Lords. And then finally was the private sector support. And, um, and so in the, in the end, I worked very closely with all of, all of those groups, um, to, which are all private sector entities, to, to support, really support the Crossrail team on the one hand, but also the TFL team on the other hand. Uh, those people were basically, at that point in time, you're up against the Treasury. And the UK Treasury is not about to spend money on a project which they do not totally accept and believe in. And so that, that team, we really spent uh, all the way up till 2007 in terms of doing the, doing the financial story uh, and arguing the case uh, that team came together uh, over and over and over again in a variety of ways. And, and London First certainly played a huge leading role 
to make that project go and, and certainly still do on, on other projects. Of course, so the, the way the funding actually breaks down, and the one thing I'm, I, can't, I'm, I, I can't show you here, is basically we were able to articulate the benefits between the economy, the private sector, and, and transport users, future transport users. And it basically works down to a third, a third, a third. And so basically what's happening is the private sector, between, uh, their, between the various uh, mechanisms and the business rates, are bringing in about $5 billion. There's about $5 billion which will come in through, through future users in terms of fares that will support debt. And then, of course, the, the, the value to the economy in terms of overall, overall benefits to the, to the economy in the long run is in the $5 billion. So, so that $15 billion, it's, kind of, it's sort of interesting how that, that's the cost, but we were able to translate the cost into benefits and who it benefited and therefore how it got paid for. And so, so, the, so you could articulate the, the private sector $5 billion contribution uh, through those, through those three, three mechanisms. Uh, there are some who, are, who would argue that it should be more, um, and, that's, 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 that, and, that, and that was recently in, in, the, financial, in the Financial Times. Um, the reality is we had to do a deal in 2007, and that's the deal we came up with. Um, and it, and it, it enabled that project to proceed. Um, some of those tools can be used for future projects, other projects, um, and it's just a, simply a question of the drive behind them. There are a number of other huge projects that are also being promoted in the UK. Uh, what's called High Speed 2, High Speed 2 and Crossrail 2 are, are both in the books right now, and of course our, look, our huge capital expenditures also looking for funding. I'll speak just briefly about the Canary Wharf uh, part. So, <clears throat> As the, as, the, as the owners of the estate, Canary Wharf does not own all the buildings. They only own about uh, uh, probably, and I think my one of my colleagues here, I think there are probably about five or six at this point in time. Uh, but nevertheless, um, they, they, they own a significant, uh, a significant amount, but they do own the entire estate. So clearly, when the government was looking at Canary Wharf, at Canary Wharf they were looking at Canary Wharf Group, specifically, uh, the, the organization that Paul Reichman created in 1987. And so, in terms of crossroad proceeding, it was like, okay, Canary Wharf, what are you going to do to help this project proceed? And if you don't, I don't think it's going to happen. And so, uh, so again, this is where you get into the whole, the whole business of doing, of doing these kind of conversations with government. Part of that deal basically involved uh, Canary Wharf having to, ag Canary Wharf agreeing that it would build the crossrail station. At the time, the crossrail station was estimated by the government's consultants to cost something in the order of 868 million pounds. Um, by any standards, that is a huge amount of money, and I can't imagine any station anywhere in North America costing 868 million pounds. Um, so they came to us and said, well, if you build that station, Crossrail will happen. And uh, so we were a bit taken aback, and we certainly weren't prepared to put 868 million pounds on the table. Uh, but nevertheless, um, what we said, well, why don't you let us look at what you've got, and we'll see where we go from there. Uh, we had about four weeks to come up with a proposal to the government that would allow them to make that decision in 2007, maybe six. And so what we did is we, 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 we reviewed their design and came up with a design that was about $368 million in raw capital cost cheaper at, at 2002 prices. For all intents and purposes, that, that would save them about a half a billion pounds on the project. And what we said is we'll build the station at risk, set time, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we will make a direct financial contribution of $150 million to it, and we'll build it. So on the left-hand side, you see the images that were created at about 2008. And on the right-hand side, you see where it's out of the water today. But the fact of the matter is it's mostly underwater. Uh, the, the deal was that we would build uh, 250,000 square feet of retail, on top of the station, because the station is way under the dock, and we will put a park on top of the station. And so the park is actually, the park is to replace the, the, the loss of the value associated with the water, and the park is open to the public who live just to the north, the north of, the, of the development. So in effect, Canary Wharf um, played a, a significant role in making the project happen, is playing a significant role in actually building the project, uh, and, and, and we are looking at various ways for instance, Canary Wharf was approached to even operate the station. So it's, it's a very different role, but again, 
they operate that development, and, and the guy who used to look after it is actually here today. They run that development. It's, a, it's, it's well looked after. It operates very well. And so for them to operate this station is not above and beyond what they're capable of doing. Now, of course, the property story comes into play, and there's no shortage of articles that you'll see like this in various property news and financial times, is that the value of property along Crossrail will go up. And, and, and of course, that's all, all, all with speculation, and the suggestion is that most property would go up somewhere in the 8, eight to 10 percent range around, around those stations along the development. Uh, and of course, this happens to be Canary Wharf. And, and, uh, and I'm sure that property will go up. Interestingly, while we were doing the project, commercial property, the value of commercial property in London dropped 35 percent. Uh, from 2000, and roughly from 2004 to 2007, it dropped. So, uh, so yes, it goes up, but it also goes down. And, um, and certainly we were faced with that. But nevertheless, no, no doubt in the long haul, I'm sure it becomes, becomes more valuable. Okay, so to wrap it, to, to kind of bring it to an end then is sort of how does it relate to, and Andre wanted me to kind of connect it to some of the, some of the issues that we're talking about here in Toronto. Uh, so on the planning side, in terms of what, what you saw there and what we've done is that it was comprehensive, it was transparent, it was thoroughly vetted uh, by, by, the, by all the players and by the parliamentary process. So from a planning perspective, it's a, it was a solid project. From the private sector support perspective, they were there, they recognized the need, uh, they believed in the business case, and at the same time were prepared to, to put their, stick their necks out and put their, their hands in their pockets, which they did. On the value capture side, you saw that there was a number of uh, mechanisms that were created specifically for that project. Um, the business rate supplement did require a new bill to go through Parliament. It was approved and is in place, as did the other two. Section 106 was already in place. The SIL, the SIL mechanism was uh, instituted in 2009, approved in 2010. So funding is being raised by all of those tools at the moment. So there is value capture that, that is happening. The question is, can you get more value? Can you get more value capture? I've always had a very interesting. There's a, there's a very interesting debate about, you know, getting uh, capturing value out of the value uplift in property, uh, and and, th and that's a that's a whole separate debate, which, which is probably having worth a conversation. That's about it. I hope that was interesting. That was a fabulous presentation. Thank you so much. And uh, I said at the beginning that Crossrail is a success story, and certainly your comments suggest that it really is. But it is nice to know that it does take time to achieve success, going back to 1880 in this case. Um, you, you, you talked about, um, and you said this at least twice, the problem is always how you pay for it. Mm -hmm. And you talked about some tools that are being used, uh, particularly the business property tax and, and uh, some development levies. How, how has the uh, private sector responded to that? I know you said they're on board with the project, they're on board with the need for it, but how are they responding to these specific taxes that they're now facing? Uh, well, before, before the taxes were proposed, we actually canvassed all of the, all of the big banks. So all of the big banks and all of the big property owners along the Crossrail route, uh, a lot of them are members of London First, or they are part of the Corporation of London, or they are occupiers of Canary Wharf. So in fact, visits were paid to all of those, all of those people. Uh, and basically, the, the concept of the business rate supplement was explained, uh, because that's where the big money comes from. It comes from the occupiers. And so we explained it to, to all of the big occupiers, and to their, right up to their chief executive level. It was always at the chief executive level. And, and they all saw the need for the, the, the more transport. And you know, if, if you're a bank like H, HSBC and you're paying 25 million pounds in property taxes for your building, 2p on the pound is not a lot of money. And a lot of people did that calculation. It's, you know, the fact is it's, it's a big enough city with a big enough population that you can generate that kind of money. And no I think discussion about property tax versus other kinds of no, taxes. No, 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 no. And I think, again, it goes back to the homework that we did in that CBRE study that basically demonstrated this is one of the ways we can do it. And again, it, it also goes back to being able to implement it within a certain time frame. It's clear. It's understandable. You can see the connection between, and of course, it's ring-fenced. That money only goes to Crossrail. Uh, so that 2P on the pound, they know where it's going. It's going towards Crossrail. Uh, and, and again, 
when, uh, when you audit uh, TFL's books, you can see the 20 million pounds a month, it's going to Crossrail. So there was no, there was no, I, I, I never sensed, you know, an outright, we, we can't do this. It, that never happened. And how did you get down from 15.9 to 14.8 billion? Ah, well, a number, a number of things happened. Um, first of all, I think it was probably, the cost of it was overestimated in the beginning. They took a very conservative approach uh, to cost estimates. And so as they got into the project and they started to do, uh, started to go up for tender, and of course, well, the Canary Wharf deal, that wiped 368 million right off the bat. So as they got into it, they discovered that you could, you could, you, you could get things for less. Uh, the UK, of course, uh, is, in, is in recession, has been for the last couple of years. So they're getting better, better prices uh, for a lot, of the, a lot of their projects. They're getting good competition. And so all of that is contributing. And uh, the, the news that I have from my colleagues in London some of whom uh, your colleagues have met, uh, is about 50% complete and they're on budget and, and it's going to happen. They, they delayed it for one year to control cash flow uh, from, the, uh, from the, the UK government side, but it's happening. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the political involvement? I mean, you talked about uh, the, the mayor of London, two mm -hmm. versions of the mayor, two versions of the prime minister. Yes. What role did they play versus the... the uh, the more technical people. I mean, who, who got involved in the technical aspects of the project? Um, okay, well, so uh, typically, so the, the mayor, uh, the TFL comes in under the mayor uh, in, Lon in London, and they're responsible for all the roads, the tubes, et cetera, uh, within, within London. And, uh, and so, but you, need, but you need the mayor, and of course, you, and you need his, his councillors to support the project. And, and I, I think that's one of the exciting things about, about both Ken and Boris is they really, you know, they were Londoners, and they were all about London. And, and, and whether it was Canary Wharf or, or, or BAA, you know, there, there's, a, there's a kind of a London uh, buzz that goes with the place. And so, so uh, but of course they rely, they rely on all those techni techni technical people to basically say this is a good project, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, Ken has his own economics advisors. Um, so a guy, guy by the name of John Ross. So all of those people, it comes together, and then ultimately they do, they become a champion. Uh, we started out under Tony Blair, and, uh, and certainly, certainly he was very supportive of the project, but again, the, the things that happened while that project was being proceeded, you know, there was the Iraq War, there was, they won the Olympics, the, the number of hurdles that came along to stop funding going anywhere near that project, and so you would get the message from Tony Blair that yes, we support the project, but you know, we don't have any money. And really what he was saying, and he was saying that to the private sector, he said, yeah, we don't have any money, but maybe you guys want to think about that. <laughs> so, so, and then of course we went through, he, he stepped down and, and, and Gordon Brown came in. Now Gordon Brown was the chancellor of the Exchequer all that time. And Gordon and his advisors, they were adamant this project was never going to go ahead. They were adamant they were not going to take it on from a financial standpoint. But then they did take on the Olympics, and the Olympics cost them six and a half, seven billion pounds. So, so bit by bit by bit, you sort of, you know, you just, you just keep working at it. And then they come on board. But of course, they all they rely enormously on on their technical people. And when you go to the UK, when you go to the UK Treasury, the people you meet there, they are the smartest that come out of all those universities in in the UK. And um, and you're you know you're subject to that kind of that kind of stuff. And then eventually you find out they want to make more money, so they start they they, they end up over in KPMG, which is <laughs> which happens to be a Canary Wharf. And uh, and so so. So then they've, so they've gone from the public sector to the private sector, so then they start to tell you what you should do when you go back to knock on the doors. So yes, KPMG was very good that way. Um, we have some members of the Transit Advisory Panel in the audience with us, and I'm going to turn to them first for questions. Anne Golden. Anne, do you mind going to the mic? That was an excellent presentation, and I hope we can get a copy of the slides, Jim. That was very, very helpful. Uh, my, my question is this. Do you see a parallel, I know you're living here now, so do you see a parallel opportunity in our city for corporate leadership to lead the charge? And I, 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 just three points under that. We don't have a single project. We're looking at the Metrolinx list of up to 20 projects. Uh, I'll have a point to add on that later. So we don't have a single, uh, so we don't have a single route, whereas this could capture the imagination. We don't have a single rail-starved development to drive and to be the, uh, you know, the real catalyst for the corporate. And the debate to date 
has focused on uh, fighting about what to build or where. Um, we, however, we also don't have a, a supportive mayor. Understatement. And, uh, <laughs> but I will, I will indicate one last thing is that uh, we're, we're putting out our second paper tomorrow morning, and, and we have an op-ed in the Globe tomorrow morning. And at the, in that op-ed and in the paper, we do raise the possibility of looking at a region-wide relief line, which would be a single project, not dissimilar from the cross rail, very much linked to the concept of uh, link, joining up with employment, uh, you know, uh, employers to employment uh, lands, current and future. And we're actually putting that idea out there tomorrow. So I'm, I'm thinking maybe that could be the single route that could, uh, you know, drive the imagination of the of the corporate, but of the corporate side. But g given our situation, uh, do you think there's a, a parallel opportunity for us? Well. <laughs> Uh, well, I've been back for three years, um, and um, I've, I've, I've been surprised by the lack of the corporate sector over and above the, the Board of Trade being vocal about things. And it's a bit like sort of, why, why isn't there transport serving this part of London or this part, this part of Toronto or this part of the, Why isn't that happening? And, and, and so I'm, I'm a bit surprised they're, they're kind of not there. On the, on, the, on the other hand, in terms of all of that stuff that's in that big plan, as you know, we've had a lot of these big, big moves. We've had the Let's Move program. We've had a lot of these big, big moves. And, and I have this worry that maybe we do too much of this big stuff. Why not just do one thing at a time? You know, uh, uh, the $8 billion Eglinton line is a big project. Uh, how many people know enough about it to say, that's a great project, you know, that it's going to do lots of things for, for, for Toronto and lots of things for people, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the kind of stuff that you saw there, I don't think you see for that particular project, and I don't think you see for a lot of those other projects. So I don't think we're quite as transparent, um, you know, and certainly you don't see a video like that one for the stuff we do here. So, so I think there's, we need to do more of that kind of stuff. Uh, for these projects here, and, and, I, and I know that uh, some of my friends in, in Metrolinx have been, have been to London and, and, and have learned some of that stuff, but I, I think we need to do more of that um, because it's just, it, it, it's, it's not, a, not clear to everybody what the value of these projects are. What, what do they actually do? On the map, we have, first of all, the Board of Trade has done an excellent job in terms of, and, and, and the business leadership there did support, for example, parking, which is a form of taxing property. Uh, and also there's corporate champions for civic action. So I mean, it's not that they haven't been to the table, mm. but they haven't really, it's not the heads of the banks that are coming out and, yeah. and uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, waving it on. I, in just listening to your presentation, what I got out of it is that uh, if there were a single route, the problem with eight routes or 10 routes, yes. it's very hard to draw that circle along every single place and say, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. even Eglinton, yeah. there are doubts about Eglinton because when you say Eglinton, unless it connects to the entire region-wide network, you're not going to have mm -hmm. those spin-off benefits. Everybody uh, knows you need a network. Mm -hmm. The Metrolink's idea is ultimately a vision of a network, but it's yeah. a 25-year mm -hmm. thing. So anyway, I, I found that uh, very, uh, very interesting. And to mm -hmm. me, it strengthens uh, support. And I have my vice chair here. I have members of my panel here. But the notion that I know Metrolink is studying, and I know TTC is looking at it, mm -hmm. of our version of Crossrail, mm -hmm. not across the top, but mm -hmm. down around, coming from you know Markham down through the city to relieve yes. the pressure and out through Meadowvale, I think, mm -hmm. could have maybe, in that case, you could build the business case more acutely. Yes, yes, yeah, and certainly that's what we did there. And Thank I, you. I think it helps in that way, in that sense. Thanks very much, Jim. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to ask uh, Paul Bedford, the, the co-chair, and I, I just want to say that we, we don't have a video like that, but Metrolinx uh, has some pretty good commercials on television. They do. They're doing... And, and when I tell people that and say, have you seen these commercials, the response is always, seriously, you watch TV with commercials? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just want to pick up on Anne's uh, comments. First, thanks very much for this. And, and uh, this big idea, we're calling it the big U in Toronto. We've all heard about the downtown relief line, which is the little U. This is the big U. And it connects the employment in the, in the central city of Toronto with the employment in 905. And, and Ian Dobson here, who's a member of the panel, has done extensive research on this. And the, being very uh, simple about it, there's about 40 million square feet of office space outside 
the city of Toronto, the Markham, the Air, Airport Corporate Centers, Meadowvale, et cetera, et cetera. Another 40 in the financial core, lots in between. And the, the opportunity to connect all that is powerful in terms of two-way ridership, not just everybody heading into the downtown, but also suburb to suburb. Uh, the, the, one of the things that was very impressive here was the travel time differences in one of your slides. Mm -hmm. and, and I think people value that, right? Uh, everybody agrees on gridlock. Everybody agrees that it's just impossible and it's got to get solved. Um, so those are, those are powerful motivations. The, my question to you is in terms of the London First organization. Mm -hmm. As I understand it, major employers, bank CEOs, et cetera, et cetera. How long did that take to come together? What was the motivation for that? Um, you know, how, how powerful was that? And what would be the equivalent of a Toronto first body like that? Um, well, okay. So first of all, uh, they are a, they're a very London-focused uh, group of, of of businesses, Canary Wharf is, is, is a member. There are numerous companies of that, of property groups and business groups, uh, Bell, British Telecom, and so on, are members of it. Uh, it has a it has a mixture of, uh, of senior people who basically run it, and then a, a number of technical people who basically do a lot of the homework and a lot of the outreach. Um, they are uh, the the, um, the people who 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 head it up are very well connected, incredibly well connected, both into the political spectrum. In fact, one the person who heads it up. Uh, she's a member of the House of Lords. In addition to that, they're very well connected to the business community. So as, as, a, as a lobby group, if you like, uh, for, the, for the private sector, for the business sector, they are a very powerful group. They do work, in a, they do work with the British Chamber of Commerce at the same time. They, they played a significant role in being able to go places that we as Canary Wharf Group could not go. However, they got a lot of information from us. Or they got it from TFL. So when, so basically, their focus would be the UK, the UK government, the national government. And so, in terms of whether it's dealing with Treasury, Department of Transport, is their focus was there, and we would supply them with the information to go there, and 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 present positive cases. Um, and and at the same time, they would hold a multitude of, of morning breakfasts. We'd have morning breakfasts uh, almost on a weekly basis where you would bring, bring these CEOs from banks, et cetera, et cetera, whether you're explaining the financial story or the, or the value story, uh, they would do that. They would organize all of that. So, so they really were um, a, a very powerful part of the team that made it happen. And they could cross the borders. They could talk to the corporation. They could talk to us. They could talk to the airport. They could talk to a whole lot of bodies dependently and together. And, and, and I think that was, that was incredibly valuable. Um, and and they, are still, they are still very much uh, working today. So, yeah, so, and, I, and I think that's what our Board of Trade does, does here. But, um, yeah. Ian? Jim, thank you very much. That was terrific. Um, the one part of the funding that you didn't spend a lot of time on was the middle part, the $5 billion that's paid for out of excess revenue on, on cash box mm -hmm. return underscored by Boris Johnson in the City of London. Mm -hmm. we, we realized there was a guarantee underneath there. Mm -hmm. I'd like you to talk a little bit about that because it was very, very instructive to me when I was over there mm -hmm. learning how they use the cash box, knowing that our system here is only funded 75% of the cash box. So mm -hmm. it's, it's subsidized and you hear people say transit loses money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the same situation in London. London uh, subsidizes about 25% of its transit. Mm -hmm. What I learned there was that these big projects actually produce cash yes. that funds the buses that help the cleaning ladies afford uh, mobility around a very expensive city and so mm -hmm. forth. And I, I heard that story. Could you explain a little bit about how they leverage that excess cash flow out of Crossrail with the evidence that people will use it, mm -hmm. for one mm -hmm. thing? Mm -hmm. And how that has really contributed to the funding, because it's a, it's a third of it. It's five billion pounds. That's right. Okay, so uh, Transport for London is, is, is allowed to do potential borrowing and does go out to the marketplace to borrow money based on its, on, on its, on its credit rating, uh, which I think is AAA. Uh, and at, that is based on, 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 to a large extent, on ridership and, of course, the value of their asset. Uh, so to a large extent, so a project like Crossrail uh, will develop huge, huge revenues uh, based on the ridership forecast. The other, the other thing that they have a history that's been demonstrated both by the Jubilee Line and the Victoria Line that projects like Crossrail 
inevitably exceed their forecast. So interestingly, uh, the, the Victoria Line, which is a north-south line, and, and the Jubilee Line, both by the Treasury, had negative uh, benefit BCRs when they were proposed. Um, and the Treasury said that they will never meet their, their ridership forecast. In both cases, they have far exceeded their, their, their forecasts and have had to be extended beyond. For any of you who have been in London and paid four pounds to get on the tube, you know it's not cheap. And so, uh, and, and of course, it will not be that inexpensive to get on Crossrail. So, the, so I think the, rea the reality is, is you pay for what you get when you ride, when you ride on the tube and when you ride on the uh, on, on, on mainline rail like this. Um, and, and to that extent, it helps subsidize the buses big time. Um, and so, on that basis, they are allowed to go out and borrow money, and they do. They do. Uh, they got a one. They got one billion right up front from the European Investment Bank. Um, which at a very, very low rate, which allowed them to get on with a lot of the early construction. So I think that's one of the strengths, is TFL has that ability to go and finance uh, and borrow money in support of itself. It has a good rating. It, has, it, it does pay back its money. Uh, it's got a good track record. So, so I think that's, that's a bonus. We don't, I don't, certainly I don't think the TTC has that ability here, uh, and I don't think Metrolinx has that ability here, but I can be corrected on that. But so I think that makes, that makes it different for TFL. TFL does have that ability. And so it, it, it in, a, in, a, in essence, it's, it's funding those fares before they come on stream. Well, I think I'm going to stop here. People are starting to wander out. It is 6 o'clock. Uh, Jim, that was fantastic, as everybody has said. Um, and we've really learned a lot. You can't always transport, may I say, one system in one country uh, to here. Uh, there are lots of differences, but I think that um, there's much to be learned from the Crossrail experience. So thank you very much. Pleasure. Just, just before you go, um, we have some events coming up in the next few weeks I just want to tell you about. Uh, our institute is part of the Big City Big Ideas series for the third year in a row. And the first lecture will be on Monday, November 4th. Uh, with Richard Florida, who will be talking about why creativity is the new economy. Um, on Tuesday, November 12th, our postdoctoral uh, fellowship uh, person this year, Zach Spicer, is going to be talking about uh, city-county separation in Ontario. And on Tuesday, November 19th, IMFG will be hosting a book launch and panel discussion on buildings, cities, life, Eb Zeidler's autobiography with Eb Zeidler and a panel of speakers. Great. So uh, please check our website or get on our mailing list uh, and you will be invited to all of these. Thank you.